Hi, everybody. Thank you. Uh, thank you, everybody, for joining us. Uh, my name is Hergen. Um, so my wife, Carrie, and I, uh, we run Subculture Travel. We're the reps for uh, two different liveaboards and a resort in Indonesia. So Pendido and Samabaya is the liveaboard, and then Alambatu Resort in Bali. Um, in addition to that, we're also both uh, Nauticam ambassadors, spent a lot of time. We lived in Indonesia for 11 years. Um, we still go back all the time. So uh, we've had the good fortune to dive um, all over the country um, and take some cool cameras along for it. Um, so we're going to share a little presentation about Indonesia for you and some diving and, and uh, drop a little knowledge on you too about the country, not just show you some, some pictures. So uh, I'm going to share my screen now so that we can um, watch the presentation. Sorry, quick technical glitch here. It's happy. There we go. Okay. All righty. So as I mentioned um, from Subculture Travel, uh, so we represent Samambaya, Alambatu, and Pendito. Um, both Samambaya and Pendito are the traditional style Panisi liveaboards. Um, Again, and they we're not, run, we're not yeah. seeing your screen, Hergen. You're not see seeing it. my screen. We see a screensaver. Oh, come on, Zoom. I don't know why my Zoom is not working. Uh, if for some reason it's another person is sharing their screen. Someone, it says someone else in the presentation is sharing their screen. That was why. Yeah. Let me try one more time here. There we go. There you go. Now you got it. All righty. So now you guys can see the screen, yes? Yep, now we can see it. All right. So there we go. We still good? Yep. Yep. Okay. So let's talk a little bit about where Indonesia is. So most of you can probably tell what that is. You've got Australia down there in the bottom right, Africa on the bottom left, and then uh, the Russia up there at the top. So Indonesia sits right there in between Australia um, and the Philippines, Thailand, um, over there on the left in Singapore. So Indonesia is quite a large country. Um, and what kind of makes it really unique is it sits right on the border there between the Pacific Ocean and the Indian Ocean. Um, and it is sort of the mixing pot between those two oceans. Um, and that makes it a very unique uh, topside and underwater environment as well. Hergen? Yes. We're seeing a screen that has three images on it. Samambaya, Alambatu, and Pendido. It sounds like you're describing a map. Yes, I'm not sure why it is not doing it. Is it doing it now? Nope. Still seeing the three images. Uh, click on play at the top there and see if that works. It seems to be, it's playing on my screen. This is the problem here. Oh. There you go. Now we're seeing the map. See now you're yep. seeing the map. Okay. Yep. yep. So Indonesia itself is quite a large country. Is not letting me forward. So, if you are you now seeing the U.S. on top of it? Yes, we are. Okay. So the U.S. is only two thousand eight hundred ninety-six miles across, and Indonesia um, is quite a bit larger than that. So, if you overlaid Indonesia over top of the U.S., it would stick out on both sides. So, Indonesia is a huge country, which means you have tons of different diving opportunities for it. So, you know, when people say like, "Oh, we went to Bali, we did Indonesia," that's like saying you went to San Francisco and you saw America. It's not quite the same thing. Um, so, you really need uh, you can go back several times and still uh, not have experienced the entire country. So let's talk a little bit about um, Indonesia by the size of it. So in 1949, the U.S. recognized the country of Indonesia. Um, why is that important? Um, it was actually the U.S. was the first country um, to recognize uh, Indonesia uh, in the U.N. and propose that it be given status because up until the Second World War, um, it was a, a Dutch colony. Um, and part of the Dutch East India Company. Um, and during the Second World War, uh, the Japanese occupied a significant part of the country. And afterwards, um, the US was one of the big proponents to 
uh, get Indonesia to receive its independence and for the Dutch to, to recognize it as an independent country. 700, that's the number of indigenous languages still in use there. Um, so at one point there was way more than that. Um, so that just gives you an idea of the, the diversity of the country itself. 221 million people live there. 60% uh, of those live on the island of Java. Um, okay. so, Sorry to interrupt, but we're still just seeing the map. I'm not sure what's going on here, why it won't continue to play here on your screen, on the screen share. Um, Are you seeing it? I'm assuming you can see the same thing, Mallory, just the map? Yeah, it's just the map. I Let me see it. There's a button that says request remote control. I can try that and see if I can flip through the... No, it's really just, it doesn't want to... Hergen, if you can email me your presentation real quick, I can run it from here. Let me see if I can request remote control and if I can. So I'm giving you, I gave you approval. Can you see it now? Uh, Just the map. Yeah, it says I can control your screen. Hmm. Yeah, I'm not. Sorry, I'm not sure why this is not allowing it to be. It continuously will not let me resume sharing. Yeah. Um. Let me stop share and restart the share and see whether that fixes it. Okay. I'm gonna try it this way instead. So you might have a little bit of a border to it, but at least it should work. Yeah, we've noticed okay. that sometimes if you- Are you, are you seeing the, the numbers now? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Now let's see Maybe what happens if I- Try and flip to the next screen and see if it works. Come on. I'm going to have to do it the, the old fashioned way here. Yeah. <laughs> I'm going to have to do it this way, aren't I? Are you able to see that at least? No. Yes, we are. Yep. Okay. I'll make this very small then to make it easier. All right. So uh, we're going to walk away kind of across the country um, and we're going to be working our way mostly from Bali um, over to Papua, um, which is where a, a lot of the diving that the Samambaya, the Pendido, uh, do. And then, of course, Alambatu is located on the island of Bali there um, on the bottom left. So we're going to start off and we're going to be looking at the area of Bali, Komodo, and Alor, which is in the bottom left there, as you can see. So Bali, Komodo, and Alor, uh, what makes it unique um, is we have the Wallace Line. So the Wallace Line runs here in between uh, the islands of Bali and Lombok and also between the islands of Borneo and Sulawesi. Um, and what that what that denotes is it's the separation between Southeast Asian fauna and Australian fauna. So back when there was um, the land bridges, that's where the land bridge stopped. Um, so east of that line and west of that line, you have completely different flora and fauna um, above, above, uh, above water. Um, but then also underwater as well, you also do get a little bit of separation um, in species. So again, uh, when I mentioned earlier, what makes Indonesia unique is it is that dividing line between the Pacific Ocean and the Indian Ocean. Um, and especially for Bali and Komodo and Alor, um, there's very narrow channels between the islands. Some of them are only 20 miles apart, 30 miles apart, um, where you have these two oceans mixing. Um, so you're getting, at certain times, you're getting a 30 centimeter height difference between these oceans. Um, and what that can cause is a lot of water movement moving through there, which is great for animals because animals, you know, underwater animals love that water moving, bringing the nutrients. Um, feeding those animals. And there's actually so much water moving through there that they had to come up with a new name for it. Uh, so this guy who studied it, uh, he came up with, a, he decided to give it his own name and he called it a spare drip. And it's 264 million gallons of water a minute um, moving through there. So what that does is it gives us a couple different sort of unique dive areas. Um, in these regions. So both in Bali, Alor, and Komodo, you've got dive sites that are in the Pacific, you have dive sites that are in the Indian, and you have dive sites um, that are in between, so in that mixing area. 
Of course, we've got Komodo dragons. Um, they're only found on Komodo, Rincha, Flores, and Gili Motang, um, which are four islands there right around the Komodo region. Also got mola molas, these giant ocean sunfish. Um, so this thing's probably about nine feet from top to bottom. Um, they will swim right up to you. And just off of Bali, there is an island called Nusa Penida where there's a sunfish cleaning station. Um, so you can just go down and hang out and these guys will come right up to you, swim around you, um, and then kind of take off. And this is a really unique place. There's not a whole lot of places in the world where you get a consistent encounter um, with these creatures. So these are some images, sort of typical images that people think of when they think of Bali. You know, Bali is Hindu. Of course, uh, Indonesia itself is majority Muslim, um, but Bali is a Hindu island. Um, freedom of religion is protected by the constitution in Indonesia. Um, so it's not an Islamic Republic or a Christian Republic or anything like that. Um, but Bali is unique in that it is uh, Hindu. Um, it's also known, of course, for its beaches and Mount Agung right there in the middle and these beautiful temples. And one of, the, one of my favorite things to photograph is actually rice. Um, rice cultivation is a huge industry in Bali. Um, and rice goes through some really unique life cycles um, that offer some really cool, different photographic opportunities when you're not in the water shooting things like these guys. Um, so Bali is mostly black sands uh, up on the northern part where Alambatu is. Um, and of course, black sand is quite well known for awesome macro muck diving. Um, so this is one of my favorite critters. These guys are called harlequin shrimp. Actually, mean little suckers, what they do is they actually pull these uh, sea stars into their burrows, paralyze them so they can't move and consume them while they're still alive. Um, so not particularly pleasant animals, but they sure do look neat and uh, they're fun to photograph. North Bali is super well known for all of the nudibranchs that you can find there. Um, if you're a nudie nerd, uh, you like to get, get your macro on and, and get some incredible nudie photos. Um, Bali is an exceptional place for it. Um, there's no shortage of variety when it comes to the different colors, sizes, shapes um, that you can shoot. And you can do these shore diving. They're right there in the shallows, right off the beach. Um, they've photographed and identified uh, thousands of species of nudibranchs uh, off the north coast, north coast of Bali. So again, no shortage of cool nudies. Frogfish, also quite popular there. These little guys like to run around on the bottom on their fins. Um, they don't really swim. Um, they're pretty much benthic and they come in all, all different sort of shapes and colors as well. So these are both clown frogfish, sort of different life stages, uh, different color patterns. Again, painted frogfish. So again, they're not very big. Um, these are probably about the size of a matchbox car. So the black sand also has some other kind of unique animals that live there. Uh, mimic octopus, so named because uh, they like to mimic other animals as a survival mechanism. Um, so in this case, he's trying to mimic or she's trying to mimic a uh, stingray moving along the bottom, uh, hoping that the animals that would prey on it normally, uh, some of the bigger fish won't notice what it is. And they mimic all sorts of different animals. Um, from lionfish, um, eels, to sea snakes, and in this case, stingrays as well. Um, these are pretty consistently found, especially early morning, late afternoon when they're out. Um, closely related is the wonderpus. Um, so they also mimic to a certain degree, um, but they mostly uh, tend to just do these kind of funky displays, like I call this one the, the hat dance, the sort of the sombrero hat dance. It's got its little tendrils up, shaking its tendrils at you, and they're always very expressive. They always have the one eye kind of cocked up a little bit when they're staring at you. Um, but North Bali is an exceptional place for finding these kind of macro animals um, and really having time with them. And the guides in Indonesia, and especially at Alamatu, um, this is what they do all day is finding these animals because you know, these animals have survived for so long because they're pretty good at blending into their background. So having somebody that can really help you find these animals um, and also help you photograph them without damaging the environment, and without damaging the animals um, is, I would say, essential to having a good experience. Back right, Bali's not all macro. Um, there is a large wreck uh, on the north coast of Bali um, called the Liberty. Um, in addition to having beautiful soft corals on it and also being an, a neat wreck, um, there is a nice school of jacks that tends to move around. Um, they're also seeing more sharks. They've also seen mola molas come up to the wreck as well. Um, it's, a very, it's a very rich site uh, and it can be dove from shore, it can be dove with a boat. Um, there's lots of options. So moving over to Komodo, again, as I mentioned, Bali, Komodo and Ala all sit at that mixing point of the Indian and Pacific Oceans. 
Um, and these currents that move through there are bringing a lot of nutrients with them. And in this particular spot, um, this is a site called Batu Balong, um, and it's a small island that sits in the middle of one of these channels that's the mixing point. And it's, you know, it's almost perfectly round. And so when the current's running from north to south, um, you basically just dive always on the slack side. And then when the current switches, you dive on the other side. Uh, but because there's so much water moving by, um, fish, even when it's, you know, even when you're on the, the back side of the island, which would normally be uh, quite slack, the fish are sitting toward the outside of the reef, feeding on those currents moving by. You just get these pulsing swarms of these antheas. Um, and on top of that, you get these amazing hard corals. So the soft corals can't really hang on in that strong a current, but these hard corals are really designed for it. So you get these exceptional hard coral gardens here. You can also do some of these sites as a drift dive. Um, this one's on a site called Fast Orange, um, which has beautiful orange soft corals, and it's a drift dive. So you're just kind of drifting along. Lots of the turtles like to hang out there. There's lots for them to feed on at the, in the shallows, and sometimes they'll just kind of hop up in the current with you and swim with you. So also a couple of pinnacles up in the Pacific area. Um, they're not very deep. They come almost up to the surface, um, and they are covered with fish uh, at slack tide. So the change between uh, incoming and outgoing tide, um, the water tends to be the clearest, um, and that's also when all the fish tend to aggregate very, very close to the reef. You know, when the current's running, they move out a little bit. When the current kind of slacks off, they move into the reef. And you can see some of those really colorful, firm-looking things in the front. Those are crinoids. Um, Komodo has an exceptional amount of crinoids there. Um, and they come in all different shapes, colors, varieties, sizes. Um, you can, I did an entire, uh, entire Komodo trip where I did nothing but do macro shots of all the different color patterns on crinoids and I never ran out of finding a new one. Um, and they really add a whole new dimension of, of color to the dive sites there. And it's not something you really see in that kind of abundance um, anywhere else. Great schools of fish there, great place to go see a school league barracuda. Um, also batfish are quite frequent there. Um, you get the big schools. And like I said, they really stack up against the islands uh, at certain times of the certain times of the day and make it really easy to have nice encounters with them. Lush hard coral reefs, as I mentioned, you know, soft corals, there are soft corals there as well, but these hard coral gardens really thrive um, in these kind of high current areas. So, you know, you go, of course, go at slack tide. You're not getting pushed around when you're doing these dives. Um, and they're quite shallow and they go right up to the edge of the island. So even for snorkeling, um, exceptional opportunities. Um, Indonesia is the ring of fire. So there's lots of active volcanoes all throughout and you can dive on the slopes of one of them in Komodo. Uh, it's called Sangyan. And there's certain parts where there's actually gas bubbles coming out of the sand. Um, so it looks really like the entire bottom of the ocean is bubbling and, and boiling on you. It's really quite a neat thing, quite a neat thing to see. So as you notice, most of those photos, the water was quite blue and quite clear. Um, and up north uh, in the summer months, so right about now, um, the water tends to be you know, in the 80s and quite warm uh, in the north and the Pacific. And then when you move down to the Indian Ocean, uh, the temperature can drop by about 10 degrees. Um, the water's a little bit richer there, so visibility is not generally as good, but everything changes underwater. So this is a shot um, from Horseshoe Bay, which is on the southern end of Ringe Island, and it's a bay, and it's shaped like a horseshoe, hence the name. Uh, and what you get there, you can see that the, the reef itself is covered not really with hard corals, but with all of these tabastria corals um, and these cup corals that come in these wonderful orange colors. There's also a lot of soft coral, and the soft coral is really this nice pink pastel color um, that you don't really see anywhere else. Um, so they really make for very unique uh, images, and it's really neat to see. And um, literally every square inch of these dive sites is covered with some kind of life. Um, soft corals, hard corals, um, crinoids. Uh, it's really just kind of a, a riot of color down there. At night, you can have some other cool things come out. Um, and this is really unique to just the Komodo area um, is the sea apples on the right there, which is a type of sea cucumber. And, and it feeds at night by pulling out these tendrils, but that real fire color to it um, is really unique. So they are a type of sea cucumber even though they look not very much like a sea cucumber. Komodo is also exceptional for macro. Um, one of everybody's favorite, blue-winged octopus. Got super lucky. Normally these guys are sitting on something like a brown, you know, uh, black sand background or something similar. In this case, this one swam over and hopped up on this beautiful green tabastria that has a lot of color texture to the back of it. Um, so really made for a nice uh, different kind of image. We've also been finding a lot of these cryptic uh, shrimp 
So if you can see it, the shrimp is right in the middle of the frame um, and it's living on these colonial anemones that take over these whip corals. Um, so they are really, really good at hiding themselves and it took a while, it takes, takes quite a while to find them. And they're also not particularly large. Great for ghost pipe fish, all sorts of ghost pipe fish. This is one of my favorite ones, the rough snouts. You can also go out at night and find the strange things. So this is kind of an unidentified tube worm it's related to a baba worm. So this thing's probably about like five feet long and comes out of the sand. Uh, I think it looks a little bit creepy and scary. Um, this is shot with fluorescence, hence the kind of crazy colors. It's also lots of these fire urchins there. And in the fire urchins, you get these shrimp, but then you also get these crabs like we have here, a zebra crab uh, that live on these urchins. And you can see it's got all the eggs there that it's protecting and holding on to. Also a very unique little critter there. Uh, you can see it's in the, in the coral there. Um, we like to call these ladybugs, type of amphipod. Um, and they sometimes will be covering everything. And they're quite a challenge to find, but they're also uh, a challenge to photograph. But they're really, you see them in other places, but not with that kind of color scheme that you see in Komodo. One of uh, Carrie's favorite nudies, uh, the Miyamira. Also, we've got frogfish there too, these nice hairy frogfish. And then one of the things that makes uh, South Komodo unique is we have a really neat, uh, very easily accessible manta uh, cleaning station um, where you can literally just kind of sit in the sand and the mantas will come uh, get cleaned and, and hang around. And then they also like to move up to the surface and feed at the surface. And this was just snorkeling, getting in the water. Carrie was really lucky, he had some really come really close to her, um, which is quite common actually when you're snorkeling there, you tend to get a little bit closer manta encounters than you do when you're uh, when you're on scuba. So it's not just for diving. You can have some pretty nice up and close personal encounters with those mantas. Um, and it's consistent. They're there most of the year. They don't really move off. Um, so it's a nice consistent manta encounter. Alor, it's a great place for macro, um, especially kind of the weird stuff. So this is one of my personally favorite critters. Um, and this is a rhinopius. So it's a type of scorpion fish. Uh, but they come in these great colors. So yellows, pinks, oranges, um, blacks. Uh, they're really a, a unique thing to find. Um, and if you get super lucky, sometimes you can also find a juvenile. Um, and those juveniles tend to start out clear and then they develop their coloring as they go. There's a certain place in Alor, in one of those mixing areas, um, where literally everything from about six feet deep to about 30 feet deep is covered in anemones. Uh, and it goes for, I would say, probably about three quarters of a mile to a mile along the side of the island. Um, and there's not really anything like it anywhere. Um, and again, because of the currents that run through, you get these sort of pulsing swarms of fish that are always about you when you're diving there. And it's really, it's just a neat, unique thing to see. In a bay called, called Byangabang, uh, you get all the, the great macro hits. You've got the, the ghost pipefish, the frogfish, everything else, but you also get um, these really neat corals that that grow there. And this is uh, a macro shot. It's not pumped up in Photoshop or anything like that. I could see this thing from quite a ways off. It really just looked nuclear. Um, this thing's only about the size of maybe a half dollar and it's curled over on itself. Um, just had these exceptional colors and patterns on it. Oliver is also known for the local fishermen there who can swim down and stay down forever um, without fins. Uh, they have their handmade goggles there that they make out of uh, coconut shell and Coke bottles mostly. Um, and so this guy, I was down there shooting something. He swam down past me, went down to about 80 feet to check his fish trap, swam up, saw me shooting something, said, hey, do you want to take my picture? And I was like, yeah, sure. So I took a couple pictures of him, showed him the picture. He's like, oh, that's cool. And then swam over, went and checked another fish trap and then went up. And I'm sitting there looking at my photos. And I was like, wait a second. He just swam down past me, went up there. I was like, I, I burned 500 PSI in the time and he was still on one breath by the time he got to the surface. It's absolutely incredible. And the kids as well love to swim down and pose for pictures. And um, it's really, it's a very unique, cool experience. Um, so let's move on a little bit. Sorry, I'm going a little bit quick because we lost some time there because of my technical difficulties. So we're gonna move on to the next areas here, um, sort of the Ambon, Band of Sea and Forgotten Islands area. So, the Banda Sea is one of the deepest uh, seas in the world and also one of the largest seas in the world. Uh, it's a very unique place. So we're gonna do some quick information about it. So in 1512, the Portuguese won the race to find the Banda Islands. Now, why did anybody care about that? Um, it's because of this, which is nutmeg. So nutmeg at a certain point was worth more in weight than gold. So if you had a pound of nutmeg, it was worth more than a pound of gold. And the Brits and the Dutch fought over it for a long time. 
And finally, in 1664, Britain decided to trade a little place called New Amsterdam uh, for the island of Rune and the Band of Sea. And that's me and my family there in, in New Amsterdam in 1982, I think, or 83. I'm the little one in the front. Uh, of course, New Amsterdam is what we call New York. So if it weren't for the Band of Sea and the Band Islands and the Band of Sea, we wouldn't have New York City. So score one. In 1858, this guy, Alfred Russell Wallace, wrote a book called On the Tendency to Depart and Definitely from the Original Type. Um, but he was a citizen scientist and he spent a lot of time traveling around Indonesia. He was a naturalist making observations. Um, and he was a citizen scientist, so he didn't think anybody would take him seriously if he went to publish. So instead, he sent everything to his friend, um, a guy by the name of Charles Darwin, uh, who was in the Galapagos at the time, working on a similar subject. Um, and Charles Darwin, of course, published on the origin of species, and it's dedicated to Alfred Russell Wallace. So he didn't just, you know, rip off Wallace's stuff and publish it under a different name. He did give Wallace credit for it. Um, but that Wallace line that we talked about earlier, um, that was based on work by Alfred Russell Wallace. So again, most of the islands in the Banda Sea are active volcanoes. So this one is Gunung Api Banda, and the most recent eruption of that one was in 1988. And why is that important? So this is an over and under shot. Uh, from that island and all of that's grown there has grown since 1988 because that's all growing on volcanic lava flow. So it kind of helped scientists get a better idea of how fast corals can actually grow. Um, kind of change the, the theories, especially for hard coral growth patterns. Um, as I mentioned, the Banda Sea is a lot of volcanoes, um, but you also have some really beautiful sandy islands, some karst islands out there in the Banda Sea. That's the bowsprit of the Pendido up there on the top left. Um, with our friend Radar sitting on the front at sunset. Um, beautiful white sand beaches, lots of birds, dolphins, um, and just that crystal clear blue water. And then up in the top right, that's the, the fort in Bandanera um, that the Dutch and the British fought over from, uh, the Dutch and the British fought over for a long time. Here's a pretty typical image of a band of sea. So, you know, these volcanoes, volcanoes sitting out in the middle of nowhere. Um, and there's the Pinito in the bottom left um, with lots of incredible dive sites. And again, you can see that beautiful crystal clear water. Lots of birds. Every time you come up from a dive, lots of birds. Um, in the Banda Sea itself, you get these really pastel colored soft corals. Again, that beautiful blue water and soft corals everywhere throughout there, all on the slopes of these islands. And also some pretty amazing, huge barrel sponges. Um, on the left there, I'm not sure who was there first, the hard coral or the sponge, uh, but I guess they're still fighting it out to see who wins. Um, there's also so quite a big dugong population down in the southern part of the Banda Sea near Alor. Um, what's unique, uh, a lot of these volcanic islands are home to very large populations of sea snakes. Um, so this is an olive sea snake and no that's not the uh, a mistake in Lightroom, the sand is actually that color because again these are volcanoes so there's a lot of sulfur in the sand. Um, so some of the sand can really take on this kind of bright orangey yellowish, yellowish uh, greenish tinge. Um, and these little fish are following the sea snake as the sea snake serves up the sand and, and you know, ushers out some prey for these, these little fusiliers chasing it around. Um, sunset, they become very active. Um, they like to pair up. They swim up to the surface to breathe and then they swim back down and swim past you. Um, they are dangerous, but they don't seem to care about divers. Uh, they'll swim around you, through you, around you, near you. Uh, they're really quite, quite docile underwater and they're very curious. They'll come up to you all the time and check you out. This is a, a little group of mobula rays, so they're kind of like mini mantas. Um, and they tend to come to these islands and swim around the islands looking for food and hanging out, so you can have some really neat close encounters. Um, and lately we've been finding more and more and more hammerhead cleaning stations. Um, so especially September, October, and then in the spring, uh, March, April, you tend to get uh, these larger hammerhead aggregations moving through. Um, and it's become quite a consistent uh, viewing opportunity for these big schools of hammerheads. You can also go do, you know, it's a couple thousand feet deep there. You can go do some black water night dives. Um, this is a long fin squid and what it's actually doing is, no, I didn't make it ink. Um, they ink and then they wait for things to get trapped in the ink and, excuse me, and then they feed on what gets trapped in the ink. So at first I was a little bit nervous. I was like, oh no, what did I do? Um, and then someone explained it to me what, what it's actually doing because the squid didn't swim away after it inked. It sat in the ink and waited for something to come and get caught and eat. Ambon. Ambon is um, very close to the island of Sarum, so which divides, which is a, the northern border of the Banda Sea. 
Um, and Ambon is one of the most amazing macro destinations as well. Um, it's got some really unique stuff living there. Uh, leaf scorpion fish on the left there, really pretty colors. Uh, carry shot of the bryzo and goby on the right there. Um, you need a lot of patience to photograph those things. I don't have the patience for it. Kerry has the full macro patience uh, to sit and really wait for these guys to, to show themselves. Um, it's not the greatest picture of a psychedelic frogfish, but I always show this one because uh, it's probably the second picture ever taken of a psychedelic frogfish. I'm um, fortunate to find it after uh, the guys at Maluku Divers found it um, and got to spend some time with it. Um, they're really unique critters. They are seeing them again there. Um, and it's unlike anything else, uh, any other sort of macro animal that you'll see um, underwater. One of my favorites, flamboyant cuttlefish. Uh, so these guys are also bottom dwelling and they have these beautiful colors so they can totally mute themselves and, and really blend into the background. And then occasionally when they're hunting or mating uh, or wandering around, they'll flash these beautiful colors. Um, and hopefully you can see them do that and get some cool pictures. And if you're super lucky, you can even get some little baby cuttlefish hatching. Um, you know, uh, the palm oil is a big, uh, big product in Indonesia and they press it out from these sort of half coconut husks. And a lot of these coconut husks end up in these bays. Um, you know, Ambon is a working harbor. So you get a lot of these um, husks end up in the water and the cuttlefish uh, really taken a liking to them. And it's a great place for them to get underneath and and hide their eggs. Um, so occasionally you can just kind of see these things laying out on the bottom. And if you're patient, and wait long enough, um, you can hopefully get to see some cool action. So moving on to uh, the last region we're gonna talk about here. Um, we're gonna talk about the Raja Ampat to Triton Bay um, area. So some pretty common photos from the Raja Ampat Triton Bay area. Um, so it's mostly these karst uplift, so limestone uplift um, islands there. Um, quite rocky and sharp, but they are absolutely stunning. Um, the reason I have the skulls in there is to give you an idea. So, you know, the, the original Papuans that live there, you can't really dig into limestone to bury. So they used to uh, uh, bury their dead in caves. And there's still a lot of these traditional uh, burial caves out that you can see when we take little boat tours and stuff around to check it out. Also, lots of these giant limestone caves. You can snorkel in them, you can paddleboard in them. Some are even big enough you can take the tender boats in them. Um, and, you know, it's not just one little region that looks like those, the rock islands that you can see up there. It's, it's, there's hundreds of these islands and hundreds of these groupings around that you can drive through and, and dive around. So in uh, Rajampad has home to 600 species of coral and that number is always growing. I know Carrie's going to tell me I probably have the wrong number up there and it's already grown again. Um, 1,700 species of fish. 86,000 square miles is the bird's head seascape. So that's everything up from Chenderwashi um, down to Triton Bay. And there's also 17 species of cetaceans that have been observed. Um, and Pandito actually runs some special trips where we spend a good portion of the day um, whale watching. And you get everything from blue whales, sperm whales, um, uh, uh, orca, dolphins, all different species of whales and cetaceans coming through um, because they are moving from uh, the Pacific Ocean down to uh, the Indian Ocean and it heads right through uh, the Raja Ampat and Banda Sea um, area. So it's not just reefs and fish, uh, you also get the big stuff moving through as well. So a pretty typical Raja Ampat reef scene there. Um, beautiful hard corals in the shallows. Great for snorkeling, paddleboarding, kayaking, um, even just Touring around in the boat, you can see a lot of these beautiful coral gardens that stretch all around these karst islands. A little bit further down on the slopes of these islands, we do get these beautiful soft corals, uh, which is you know what a lot of people associate Raja Ampat with. Um, there are just tons of different colored soft corals. And when the current's running, these soft corals actually inflate themselves with the water. So if you go at slack tide, you're not really gonna see it. But once the current starts to run a little bit, you get in the water and you really see these soft corals start to open up. Um, and the fish also start swarming around them as well. And you can get some really unique, um, unique images. And they come in all different colors. There's the pinks, the oranges, the clear yellow, I mean, the clearish, more yellowish, whitish ones. Um, and they're not deep. They're very close to the surface, right on the slopes of these islands. Um, and they grow all over these rocky outcroppings that you get from these karst islands. Um, Rajampat also has a really large mangrove area and several of them. 
Um, this is from an area called the Blue Water Mangroves, um, which has especially clear water. And in some places you get these soft corals also growing in those mangrove forests on the mangrove tendrils. Um, and you get, you know, it's great visibility and you can just snorkel around and um, really kind of get a unique, different, different look in a mangrove forest than what we normally associate with sort of the dirty, uh, the kind of dirty, not so clear, close to shore mangroves that we typically see around here. Rajapa is also great for macro. Um, we've got lots of different kinds of pygmy seahorse. Um, so here we have the Bargibantes and they live in these colorful sea fans. Um, and if you don't disturb the sea fan, the polyps are all nice and open and you can really see how well um, these seahorses are able to blend. So these guys are quite small. It's maybe, I don't know, two grains of rice. And there's several different color schemes. So this one, this type of sea fan doesn't really have any polyps um, to open up. Um, and so the seahorses tend to mimic a little bit the the type of sea fan that they're living on. Um, and so this guy's kind of peeking out at me a little bit behind one of those, uh, one of those polyp arms. There's also a large uh, population of wobegong sharks or carpet sharks um, in Rajampat. Um, you can find them in, in other places in Indonesia, but really in Rajampat, we tend to see some places where we get lots and lots of wobegong sharks. And this is just under a jetty. Um, kind of spotlighting him with two strobes there as he's lifting up off the bottom. And these guys are masters of camouflage and they're ambush hunters. So they just sit on the bottom and place themselves out and wait for unsuspecting fish to swim by and then snap them up. Um, we also get these large groups of sweet lips. Um, I'm, I'm not sure the fish would appreciate the name, but um, I think it's a pretty accurate description of them. And when the current starts to pick up a little bit, these guys like to ball up together and especially they like to ball up with these bronze sweeper fish. Um, and they ball up right in front of sort of these natural cavities in the reef uh, and they let you get really, really, really close to them. Um, and they don't really seem to mind too much and they're very happy to have their, their photos taken. They're really quite cute fish. Um, in these karst islands, in the bays within these karst islands, um, we get lots of big populations of these um, jellyfish. So just like Jellyfish Lake in Palau, except you don't have to really hike in, you can just kind of drive back into these lagoons. And in the majority of them, you'll find, you know, some have larger populations than others. Um, you'll get these stingless jellyfish that you can just kind of hop in, snorkel around with or die with. Um, and you get kind of the unique perspective because you get some of these lagoons, the karst, the karst ridges stick up quite high. So you can really get some of the nice dense jungle uh, topside into your images. So this one's a little bit of a reflection um, with some of that topside in it as well. Got lots of jetties, um, lots of soft coral growing on these jetties. Also, sometimes we get these schools of uh, scad coming through that like to stay underneath the jetties for quite a while. Again, these kids grew up around the water. They love to jump in the water. They love to have their photo, have their photo taken. Um, I could not smile and open my eyes in salt water. I'm not sure how these kids manage to do it and be happy about it, but they'll do it for hours on end. Um, love to have take their photo taken. So much fun to, to be able to get in the water with them. Um, and, you know, they really take a good photo, uh, very photogenic kids. At certain times of the year, we get these big schools of silver sides moving through. Um, they kind of form these tubes, and most of these islands kind of have a little bit of an undercut underneath them. Um, and so the kind of silver sides will hang out underneath the undercuts, and chasing them are these mobula rays. So we can kind of get these times where you get these big schools of fish moving through and then you've got the mobula rays chasing behind them. Rajampat also has a large resident manta population um, and it's one of the few places in the world where you get um, reef mantas and oceanic mantas co-mingling um, on the same dive site. So this is kind of a manta ray mating train. Uh, the manta in the front is a female. She's already very pregnant but the males behind her obviously hadn't figured that out yet because uh, they chased her around for a good 45 minutes anyway. Again, you can get in the water and snorkel with these guys and see some really, get some really nice close encounters as well. Um, Triton Bay um, is a little bit further south on the uh, Indonesian, uh, the Indonesian New Guinea side. Um, and again, kind of a very unique area. It's very remote, um, but just these lush soft corals that go right up to the surface. We also get the big schools of, of, of bait fish going through there in these just massive black coral forests. Um, what it's also known for up there is we get lots of whale sharks moving through um, and they come up to these bagans, these fishing platforms um, where they get 
you know, they, they, the lights bring in all the small fish at night and then the whale sharks show up in the morning to, to feed on those small fish as well. So you can get some really nice um, close encounters with these big guys. So Steve, do I have enough time to show a video or should we go to the question and answers? I think we need to wrap it up, Herg. Okay, we can go straight to question and answer if you like. Yeah, yeah that'd be great. Yeah, I think we will start off. I'm sure I'm sure Carrie's on her way back in here. So when she gets here, I'll do my best to, to start us off. Awesome. Well, I have a few announcements anyways. Thank you, Hergen, for that. That was amazing. And it made me feel like I was back in Indonesia. So thank you for that. Um, I just wanted to Welcome. mention that. Thanks we for having us. Yeah, of course. I just wanted to mention that we do have a gear sale tomorrow. Um, from 10 to 6 and then on Sunday from 12 to 5 so please make sure to come in and see us it's the best deals on gear all year round um, our next presentation is with Cosmel Marine World at 6 30 if you haven't already registered for that you can visit Dreamweaver Travel or Weaver's Dive and Travel and go ahead and click on the link and get registered for that um, and yeah, I think we'll just wait for Carrie to get um, our prizes and uh, we'll get Steve on. She's here. Real. Hi, Carrie. Hi, hang on once again. Okay. No problem. I'm going to jump in for a second, if you don't mind. Um, just want to thank Hergen for great presentation. His uh, images are stunning, as usual, and uh, makes me long for Indonesia even more. Um, I did my first trip to Indonesia about 24 years ago and probably have gone back at least once a year ever since and feel like I've not even scratched the surface of what there is to dive there. So um, there's lots of opportunities to dive there. We have several trips coming up. We have a Forgotten Islands trip in March on uh, uh, another liveaboard <laughs> in the country, but... Uh, <laughs> It's, uh, I've only got two spaces or two rooms on it right now. So if you're interested in that one, let's get on it. Um, but uh, Carrie, why don't you tell us what you're gonna give away and then we'll give it away. Sure, do, are there any questions that I need to answer or are we out of time for that? I'm sorry, do you have questions, Mal? Um, I did have one question that I thought was really interesting. Um, someone asked if you're able, I mean, we covered so much ground in Indonesia with all those fantastic pictures. Someone asked on the liveaboards, do you cover multiple areas of Indonesia on the liveaboards? Yes. yes, both Samabaya and Pandito um, run trips between Bali and Raja Ampat. Basically all of the areas that Hergen covered in his presentation, we run trips to, and it, we move the boats based on weather and conditions. So you'll notice if you go to the websites, you'll see different um, itineraries and we try to move the boats around based on the best time um, for each area. So it kind of seems like you can go throughout the year, but you may just be going to like different areas and on different boats. It was so traditionally the Komodo season is May to September. Band of Sea, we run September to early December and also March and April and sometimes into May. The Raja Ampat season um, has traditionally been known to be November to let's say April, but you can dive it year round. The only time that we typically don't run trips to Raja Ampat is July and August, which historically has been the most rainiest season. Mm -hmm. um, so but we so we try to move the boats and schedule trips based on best weather and conditions for each area. Got it. Fantastic.